بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم وصلى الله على سيدنا محمد وعلى آله وصحبه وسلم. Peace and love. Welcome back to the Travelers Podcast. I'm Brother Ali. Our guest this week is really special. Dr. Ebony is a licensed psychologist based out of Austin, Texas, and she's the author of several books. One of them is called Food Is Not Bay, B A E. <laughs> like food is not your baby. Food is not your beloved. Food is not your romantic partner. <laughs> like food is not <laughs> food is not the love of your life. <laughs> I'm laughing because of just what that statement has meant to me. And I'll get to that in a second. But she is also the creator of a podcast called Food Is Not Bay, And she also is the creator of My Therapy Cards. Uh, there are several versions of these cards with different audiences in mind. But My Therapy Cards were created originally for Black women because there are so few Black women therapists. Uh, it really is a field that is growing but there are still not a lot of Black women therapists. And I'll say more about that in a second. But Dr. Ebony developed uh, my therapy cards specifically for Black women who are having barriers to therapy. And these are cards that are beautifully produced. The art on these cards is really incredible. And it's basically a series of prompts and questions that give people permission and openings and direction in what questions to ask self and to reflect and to meditate on things that just give people the opportunity to really reflect and to sit with ourselves and to know ourselves better and to open up exploration of self and communication with self and presence with self. So these cards were developed with that in mind. And then there is a set also for Black men. And this is a really revolutionary, beautiful, incredible idea and then also Dr. Ebony, along with being a therapist, along with being a public food relationship strategist, you know, this is a really important topic to think about the relationship that we have with food and to create strategy around that. You know, she, this is a, a title. So I became aware, I personally became aware of Dr. Ebony because my wife is one of a small handful of Black women therapists in the Twin Cities. And so she, was following all of these different therapists. And, and then when, when we moved to Istanbul, Turkey, one of the declarations that I made to myself is, I'm going to get really serious about my own health, about my own relationship with therapy. So my physical health, my mental health, my spiritual health, you know, I've carried extra weight for a long time. And I stated as a promise to myself that I'm going to get serious about this. So when I got to Istanbul, uh, you know, shout out to my man Ahmed Fahmi, who's an Egyptian American brother. A lot of people know his brother, Sheikh Yasser Fahmi. But Ahmed Fahmi is somebody who used to be big, who used to be heavy. And now he runs marathons and he is, is somebody that really has spent a lot of time pursuing health, wellness, fitness. And he told me right off the top, he said, I'm gonna connect you with a trainer, I'm gonna help you learn where to shop and what things to eat and things like that. And this is going to be a journey for you to find out what works for you. But he said, man, I can tell you these outward things to do. You can go and, you know, I can tell you what to eat. And if you eat it, when, when I tell you to eat it, you can work with this trainer, but this really going to be temporary. It's all just going to be arranging the chairs on the Titanic until you get in touch with your relationship with food and your relationship with your body and your body's relationship with food. And it's a deeply psychological, spiritual thing. And so him naming that for me made me really reflect on that. And I remembered this woman, Dr. Ebony, that my wife follows and really appreciates. And I know that Dr. Ebony had this podcast and this book called Food Is Not Bay and is a relationship, a food relationship strategist and coach. And so I started listening to this podcast and it was such a revelation to me. One of the things she said was, give yourself three years, like know what your goal is and understand that diet culture is not your friend. The scale is not the only way to determine your overall wellness, but come up with a goal, understand that that goal is a living, breathing thing 
that might not be permanent and give yourself three years because you're going to lose some weight and then you're going to fall off your regimen and you need to know what that means. And that's part of your journey. And then you're going to come back around and you're going to tailor, you're going to change the different things that you do, the ways that you eat. You have to be present with that stuff for several years and give yourself that amount of time because that will be probably around that period will be the amount of time that you need to just develop a new healthy relationship with your body, with yourself, with food, that this stuff is going to take time, you know? And, you know, currently where I, where I sit now, I'm about a year in and some change and I'm constantly discovering things that are working for me. And it shifts sometimes, you know? So I had a huge amount of a burst of energy and progress when I was in Istanbul. And then I came back to tour in America and I held out for a long time, but then I fell off. And then I, I regained some of the weight. I started feeling like I was losing ground, but I knew from Dr. Ebony saying, that's part of it. Falling off and getting back on is part of the journey. So it's not that you're off. So now you just go back to wilding and eating whatever and doing whatever. You don't give up. That falling off is part of your, uh, your journey. So sit in that, be with that, be present with that. What was it? What were the thinking? You know, And then also therapy in general, the therapy that's gone along with that has taught me how to slow it down, slow down my reactions to things. You know, So some of the times that I think I need to go to food it's like, well, okay, let me check in with my body first. Am I actually hungry? Am I dizzy? Is there something wrong in my body? Am I actually in crisis to where I need to eat? Because if not, then it's something else, you know? And so what is it that's telling me that, you know, I, after a show, I need to put in this Uber Eats order, you know what I'm saying? And that I need a cheat day and I need a cheat meal and I need to eat you know, ice cream or whatever my thing is. Is that real? You know, and where is that really coming from? And what is it that's actually driving that? And let me slow down for a second. You know, and I got to the point where like, you know, I, I would look at that stuff for a second and think about that food and remember what it feels like to eat it. And remember what it feels like after I get done eating it, what it feels like the next day. And be able to just make a better decision. You know what I'm saying? Maybe... You know, and like Dr. Ebony says in our conversation, sometimes eating pizza is the right thing to do. Sometimes eating ice cream is the thing to do. But being able to just slow it down, be present with myself, give myself permission to all of that. So Dr. Ebony's work has been really, really important for me. Also, as I step out into being completely independent, you know, entrepreneur and my own manager of my own career, seeing her. Uh, guidance in that has been really, really very helpful. So I mentioned her on the podcast and y'all started going to her site and ordering her therapy cards and following her. And so she, without her and I ever even talking, noticed this uptake and this burst in business, you know, and people started going back and listening to her podcast because I talked about it on this podcast. And so I reached out to her. I saw a post that she actually made it's just like, yo, I don't even know who the, she didn't even know who I was and wasn't aware that I knew who she was. And um, so we connected based on our two podcasts benefiting each other. So this is our conversation with Dr. Ebony, that, and it's our first time talking, and I'm so grateful to have spoken to her. So I want to give a shout out to my wife for making that connection. This is our conversation with Dr. Ebony. We're sponsored, as always, by the Zakat Foundation. We're also brought to you this week by BetterHelp Online Therapy Platform. And uh, enjoy this episode of the Traveler's Podcast. Dr. Ebony. Hey, Brother Ali. How are you? <laughs> I'm so happy to finally talk to you. I'm like, happy to talk a, to you. you I'm, I'm a fan. I am a uh, beneficiary of wow. you and your work and your wisdom. And... Um, it's just really meant a lot to me. So my wife is one of a small handful of black women therapists from Minneapolis. She's really originally from the Bronx, New York, but mm -hmm. she moved to, to Minneapolis for us to have our family. And then that's where she did her training. She's a clinical social worker. And so she started by 
following just a lot of black women therapists, therapists in general, but especially black women therapists. But of all of them, she was just constantly sharing your stuff with me. Like, you, you got to check her out. You got to see what she's saying. And wow. when we moved to Istanbul, I, I really was like, one of the things I'm going to do, this is about almost two years ago now. I'm like, I'm really going to take this opportunity to focus on my own self-care. I've been a musician for 20 years, independent musician for 20 years, which means I got to go, 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 go all the time. Mm-hmm. Giving, 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 you know, on stage, all this kind of stuff. I'm like, I'm finally going to take this time. So I met with a trainer and he said, I can give you some exercises to do. I can give you some, uh, you know, a meal plan to follow. But all that is, just, and you'll lose weight in the, for the time being. But then as soon as something changes, you're going to go right back until you deal with your relationship with food and then ultimately your relationship with your body. And that's mm-hmm. going to require therapy to do. That's the second you said that, I saw your face come into my mind. <laughs> wow. And I was like, oh, I know exactly where to go. So wow. the Food Is Not Bay podcast became like you were my companion when I first moved here and was like walking all over Istanbul trying to figure out how to get the lights on, how to get Wi-Fi, how to get all this stuff. And it really created this foundation for me that that has really, really helped so much. So I'm just really grateful to you and for you and happy to be talking to you. Well, thank you. That means so much. When I heard that uh, on the last podcast, I was, I was like, is this because somebody put it on Twitter? They said, "Oh my God, I heard you on Brother Ali's podcast." I said, "Is this spam? <laughs> is this spam?" Because you know, I've been away from the podcast for a while, so to hear that it's been that inspirational and is not current content because it's all it's, it's evergreen, right? It's, it's essential no matter when you listen to it. But it touched me so because I'm always telling people create the content, put it out, tell people what it is that you know, share with people, and I was blown away that it had reached you and that your wife was somebody who continuously just supported and talked about the work that I do. Blown away. So I'm I'm even more excited to be talking to you. <laughs> yeah, it's so really funny. dope. And we're fans. So like we share clips and like, you know, we, we'll both be busy throughout the day and we'll be like, did you see what Dr. Everdy said today? And like, we'll quote, you know, we'll quote like, like our favorite show or something like that. Um, there was one that we had for a long time where you had said that people don't want to go to therapy because they're like, I'm not going to tell somebody I don't know about all my business, but you put it on Instagram, you put it on, <laughs> you know what I mean? You put it on Facebook, <laughs> you tell a bunch of people that don't even know you that can't help, you might as well tell one person who can. Like, who man, can that help, was a, right? That was a hit record to us. Like we, we were running that one back for, for weeks. So. You know, it was something so funny, I'm laughing so hard, it's because sometimes I just, I get in trouble with the things that I say, and sometimes mm. it lands perfectly with people. And so I'm just kind of like always, was that too much? Was that too much? So the fact that that resonated with y'all um, means a lot because I, you know, I'm, I take a risk. I put it out there. It is what I think, and it's my authentic self. And what I'm learning is that it's the authenticity that resonates with people, regardless of yes, kind of what I think about it behind the scenes. So that's right. Yeah, the authenticity is is absolutely what it is, and because of that. And one of the things that I learned from you, so I wasn't podcasting when I came here to Istanbul either. Mm-hmm. Like I just was doing music and and speaking and things like that. So part of what, part well, another one of the inspirations that I got is just really you doing it and, and speaking so clearly um, and, and giving others like me permission to just create a world that's based on what's my world. Mm-hmm. Like just take take the things that are important to me that matter to me even though these things might not seem like they have a lot of things in common to other people, but just to be authentic and whole and real in public and then let that find the people that it finds and speak to the people Mm -hmm. it speaks to. Like so much of what you're doing is really important in the culture in particular because of the fact that not only are you opening the door for people to understand more and learn about therapy and, and really get an idea for what that is, but also trauma as a phenomenon and also relationship with food, but then also you're such a leader and you're, you, you, you're so generous in your own journey with your business and giving particularly black women permission to like, you know what you know, you're an expert on what you know, and you, there's something that you have to offer that nobody can offer but you. And if you don't offer it, a fake version of you is going to be out here offering it. <laughs> like somebody's getting your money right now. <laughs> and stop thinking that what you have isn't worthy of sharing because there's somebody who needs what you have. 
One thousand percent. And and I I really believe that. I really stand firm on that. We we have credentials. We have experience that is going to resonate with somebody in a way that somebody else's experience and credentials is not going to resonate. And I think that because we judge ourselves so much and we're so critical of kind of what's already out there and us feeling like we're not adding anything unique, we kind of hide in the background and become shadows um, in the work. And I really am passionate about your message is going to be for who it's going to be for. Somebody will not want to get it from me. Somebody will not want to get it from you, but your message is what somebody needs and the way that you can give it. And so I like to kind of promote that and inspire people because it honestly comes from my own journey of judging myself, judging myself, not thinking that what I have is going to be good enough or thinking that I'm just going to have to go with the flow and kind of be this, this kind of minion of a psychologist and all these therapists that are out there. And I've never felt like I was never felt like I was just like another person. So I was like, I'm going to put, I'm going to put myself out here. I'll second guess myself (laughs) for hours to come, but I'm going to put it out there and just let it sit for now. And I wanted to give other people kind of inspiration to do the same because we need all the voices that we can get, especially, especially as black folks and black women. There's like you said, your wife is one of few and that's just in Minneapolis, right? Yes, ma'am. Think about Think about the the entire country. 4% of Black women are psychologists. A single digit number of that is therapists in general of Black women. I, we'll, we find each other, so it seems like a lot. But in the grand pool of things, in the grand scheme, there's not many of us. And so if we can give information out there for folks who look like us, People can understand what it's like to to really heal and hear healing messages from folks who are interested and invested in them, their growth, their healing from an authentic place, not from an exploitive place or colonized place. So it's really important to me for all those reasons. And then the more courageous that people like you become about allowing more of yourself into the work, to talk the way that you talk, to dress the way that you dress. I mean, even the, the the different ways you do your hair and the glasses you wear and the, you know, you can see the stuff in the back of your house and the music that you're listening to. And when we mm-hmm. like those things that you bring into it, it, it makes a person understand like this is a therapist that will understand me. This is a person that's not going to emotionally overreact if I describe what my life has been like. I know that my wife was in therapy with a white therapist who was a really good therapist to her. But there's times where she would just talk about what it was like, just normal stuff. Just being in a, a family in the you know in the projects in the Bronx in the '80s and all the things that were happening, and she's like, I'd be talking about my stuff. I'd look up, and my therapist would be crying about just me describing my life. And it's like, wow. this isn't the place for that. My wife wasn't a therapist yet, but it's like, mm-hmm. this isn't the time for you to be thinking about, oh, that's terrible. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like, mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. you need to be keeping your emotions together to be to, to be able to hold space for me. This is about my stuff. This is about you this learning how me. ugly America really is. Yeah. Absolutely. So all of those I, things I had that a, you- well, mm. Can I say something to that? Please. I had yeah. a white therapist at the height of the pandemic. And she- was a transparent white woman in that she said, you know what, Ebony, I am only going to be able to take you so far. This is at the height of the pandemic, the height of the social uh, unrest, right? She's like, I'm only going to take you, I'm only going to be able to take you so far. She said, so I understand if you need to switch and find a therapist who looks like you and understands exactly where you come from. And so that was so liberating, I think, for me um, and healing because it's not that she was a bad therapist, it's that she understood in herself as a therapist, that there was an experience that she just could not tap into that wasn't going to get me to the place that I needed to get to in that time. So shared experience there. Yeah. And I mean, sometimes that's the best that you can really expect from somebody who doesn't understand the cultural, the cultural just differences and realities, because I mean, those things have so much to do with the way that we're formed as people, the way that we understand ourselves and our possibilities. And there's just so much there. What was, what, I mean, what are you, what do you share with people about your own journey? Cause that's one thing with all of the content of yours that I've, that I've mm-hmm. taken in and absorbed and benefit from. I don't know much about your personal story. Yeah. Which one? The therapy story, the food relationship story. Cause I feel like there are so, there's so many. <laughs> yeah. All of it. I mean, 
Okay. I don't know much about it. I know you're in Texas now. Are you originally from yeah. Mississippi or Alabama? I'm originally from Mississippi, yeah. So you know what? This is this is interesting, and I'm just going to be as transparent as I can. That's one of the things I'm working on in therapy. While I'm an open book, I find my friends will even tell me, Ebony, we don't know a whole lot about you. Like, you're transparent, but you're cautiously transparent, right? Like, you said, oh, we know the music you listen to. We know you travel. We know you go out. We know you do this. We know you like football, all these things. But really, like, what's your story? So I appreciate that question um, because I do feel like I compartmentalize so much when I'm and I give so many other people space that I don't oftentimes give myself space in those relationships too, right? Mm-hmm. So that's a good question. <laughs> it's me doing my therapy work now. Um, so yeah, I'm originally from Mississippi, uh, from Jackson, Mississippi. I grew up the middle child. Uh, the reason I got into psychology was because I was in a, a college prep program through high school. And one of the classes that we took, which is unusual, is uh, psychology. We don't, mm-hmm. You don't usually take that in high school. Mm-hmm. And I remember walking in one day and my teacher said, hey, Dr. Burrell, which is my maiden name. Hey, Dr. Burrell. And I said, Huh? He said, yeah, you're going to be a doctor, right? And I'm so competitive. I'm really competitive. And I was like, okay, got it. Bet. I'm going to be a doctor. And from then on, he was like, you're going to be a a psychologist. You're going to be a doctor. And I knew I wanted to be in the medical field, like in medicine in some type of way. Didn't really know in what what, uh, capacity. And so I majored in psychology my freshman year. And I knew that I, I was like, I'm never going to, I'm not going to want to work for somebody for the rest of my life. How can I be as autonomous um, as I want to be? And the only way to do that in psychology was to go get a PhD. So I knew from then on that I was going to have to go to a PhD program. But also I saw education as my way out. I I saw it as my way out of poverty. I saw it as my way out of never having to worry about if the bills were going to be paid, never having to worry about if I was going to come home and my phone was going to be off. Because at that time we had landlines. If my phone was going to be off and my friends were going to try to call me and then I was going to be embarrassed because there was going to be a doubt on all of this stuff, right? So I was like, what's going to give me the best shot at not having to ever live through this again? And so Mm -hmm. that's where I was like, on top of being told that I have to be a doctor, that's the way I heard it. And also, this is my way out. I was like, I have to keep going. Um, And so that's what I did. I didn't get into grad school. I went to Jackson State. I didn't get into the PhD program right after I applied. I had to take a year off. Then I went and got a master's. Still didn't get into a PhD. Had to take a year off. Then I got into the PhD program. Mm -hmm. So there's a lot of failures along the way for me. Taking a year off, taking a year off. And then once I got into my grad program, my uh, PhD program, I had an internship. I got the postdoc, but I also had to take some time off because I didn't pass the licensing exam the first time. I'm a great student. I'm not a great test taker. Mm -hmm. And part of not being a great test taker is being from where I'm from. We don't have a, you know, we didn't have schools with extensive language programs and vocabulary programs and all that stuff. So that's just was not a strength of mine. Um, Mm -hmm. And so I had to take the test again. And so I tell people all of that to say, I'm persistent. And most of it is out of survival mode. And I'm real honest about that. (laughs) Most of it is out of survival mode. I don't have an option. And that's this is the way that I saw it for a long time. I don't have a choice. I have got to make this work. This has got to work. And so part of what drives me now is still survival mode a lot of times. So I'll create something, create something, create something. And I'm never really just sitting still in the creation because I'm like, what's next? What's next? I did the podcast. Okay, what's next? We have the therapy yeah. cards. What's next? Let me do a yeah. program where I coach other mental health professionals. So I'm always moving, moving, moving. Because on top of being creative, on top of wanting to pour into people and inspire people, a lot of my actions are coming from a place of urgency. Let me say this. A lot of the urgency behind my actions is coming from a place of survival mode. And Mm -hmm. and so I have to remind myself, you're not in that place. You are far removed from that place. So earlier this year, I actually quit my full-time job. I've had a full-time job this entire time. And I was working for the VA, and then I was working for the city of Austin, working with the fire department, right? So I've had a full-time job up until March of this year doing all of this stuff. And I didn't get to a place where I trusted myself until I worked through it in therapy. And my therapist said, your issue is that you don't trust yourself to be okay. And so when I worked through the trust and the issues of safety 
And I had to keep reminding myself, you built a foundation for yourself where you are now out of what you were trying to get out of. You can stop running from that. So that is something that I'm continuously having to remind myself, even when I'm trying to take a break, even when I'm working on my relationship with food. You're in, so we can talk about that in a, in a second. But a lot of the fat phobia that's surrounding that too is, is survival mode functioning. Like, oh, I need to work out because I don't want to be this, or I need to eat this because I don't want to be this. And a lot of my work is just slowing myself down to remind myself of what my current reality is instead of running from what my past reality was or what I assume my future reality is going to be. Mm-hmm. That's, that's amazing too that, that somebody <laughs> it really is yeah and I just wanted to give it give it a breath sometimes it needs mm-hmm. a breath you know um, yeah. for for a teacher to have said to you Dr. Burrell and to say that to you like you're going to be uh, you're going to be a psychologist mm-hmm. and it, so it's like so this comes up so often on this podcast like for me you know I was a little kid and KRS-One came to the university where I was. He was my favorite like MC. Mm-hmm. And I asked a question. He was doing a lecture though. And so he brought me on stage. I asked a question. He was like, come on stage. I was 13 years old. And I stood there with my favorite rapper and I looked out to the audience and all these people were there for a lecture. And he talked to me and signed a book that he had written for me and stuff. And I just knew that day, like, this is going to be my life. This is what I'm doing. Mm-hmm. Like I'm sharing this stage with him. And almost everybody that I ask about you know, that, that's done something that society says we're not supposed to do. There was somebody who planted the seed and made it not only possible, but it's like, it's inevitable. It's like, this has already been spoken into existence. Mm -hmm. And then we become that for other people. But I wonder, um, when was the first time that you saw someone like yourself in the role that you're in now, be it with business or therapy or, you know, being the, the public person that you are? It was a mix of things, right? Mm. So I remember, so my, my psychology teacher was a black man. He was actually mm. a black gay male. So that was, mm. that was interesting, right? Because you had all these marginalized identities, right? Um, and then I remember going to my PhD program and the woman who said yes to me, because if, if, uh, if your listeners know anything about being chosen for a PhD program, it's almost like the draft. You go and you submit, you apply, and they may take nine or eight people, especially at a university where you have to go in person. So in my cohort, there were nine people buying, you know, out of all these um, people who applied, they were only taking nine people. And the reason they take you is because of the space that an advisor or um, professor may have on their team. So if they don't have the space on their team, you don't get a slot. So this black woman had space on her team. And I remember her telling me when I got in, there was something that I said in the interview that was so black. I can't remember what I said. And she was like, yep, I'm choosing her. She's she's coming with me. <laughs> and so she was a black woman with locks. And we're still colleagues today. We're still mm. friends today. And she had locks and she looked like me. She was young. She looked looked like she was just so eager to learn. I was like, how does she get in here? How does she get in here? And I said, I... I remember interviewing with her and I was like, I just was so curious about how she got in when I kept hearing no. Because right? remember, I kept, I kept hearing no. And when she took me in, I was her, I was her research assistant and I was her um, teaching assistant. So I was with her all the time. And she poured into me and helped me develop my understanding of what psychology was, what therapy was, what critical thinking was in a way that was required for that level of of education and training. So it was her. She helped me to figure out that I was interested in the sexuality development um, of Black women. She helped me to understand and kind of pour into me that you are going to get an internship. You are doubting yourself. So she worked with me on a lot of judgment and kind of self-doubt. So it was her. When it came to business, though, the business of psychology, I didn't see anybody. Because right. she was a professor. And I okay. knew I didn't want to be a professor. I knew I didn't want right. to be that. Because after I saw that salary, I said, oh, no, I'm not doing that. <laughs> and, and I'm not about to be, because professorship is publish or perish. Now, right. if you tell me a person who's in survival mode that if you don't publish, you're not going to have money, I was like, oh, no, that's not me. 
remember, this is supposed to be my way out. So I didn't yeah. see anybody. It wasn't until I got on social media that I saw a lot of black women entrepreneurs putting themselves out there and offering services like coaching and um, business strategies and things like that. And I said, well, how would that look for a therapist to do that? I didn't know. I didn't have a formula for that. So I actually started out as a coach. That's where the food relationship stuff comes from. Aha. Uh-huh. Okay. Mm-hmm. Cause I didn't know what a therapist looked like online like that. There was no model. How do you feel about, I mean, there are so many social media influencers that might not be licensed. They might not be trained, <laughs> so, but you'll see people saying like, I'm in the, I'm in the mental health field. <laughs> and I mean, and I, I, I feel like you might be referencing this when you're telling folks like other people are, are getting your money. Um, and I know the way that my wife feels about it, but <laughs> how do you feel about folks that are like social media influencers that are are teaching whole classes that are like, you know, they, they, they're coaching people. Maybe they're doing something that if you didn't know better, it might look like therapy. Um, as a, I mean, this is a phenomenon though, you know, of people doing this. And I'm just always curious to see as someone who is, you know, trained and licensed and in a community of people that also have shared the license and what have you. How do you feel about that? You know, I'm so on the fence, but my first reaction is I cringe. Mm. I cringe because we're playing, when I say playing, this is what's happening. We're playing with folks' lives. Mm -hmm. We're playing with real issues. And I don't think people understand the level of training, the level of understanding, the level of critical thought, the level level of um, kind of philosophy that's put into understanding what somebody is doing and what somebody is going through. And to me, it minimizes the seriousness. It minimizes the importance of mental health Mm -hmm. because we don't see people, we do see people, but we call them con artists. We don't see people pretending to be lawyers. We don't see people pretending to be surgeons. Right. So why do we see people pretending to be mental health professionals? And one of the reasons is this is where I'm on the fence. It's the field, it's, it's our fault. It's the regulatory agency's fault in mental health that is not tight enough. It's not tight enough. I think it's the government's fault that it's not regulated or taken to a level of importance enough to where anybody can infiltrate and say, I'm a I'm a trauma coach. And then the coaching right. field is not regulated. Coaching right. field is not regulated whatsoever. And so anybody can call themselves a coach and use their experience to help people. Here's where I'm torn too. I don't I believe that as uh, as community, there are healing mm-hmm. practices that all of us have to offer up to our community. Yes, ma'am. Yes, I do believe that. And I do believe that I don't believe that therapy is the only way that somebody can reach healing. Mm -hmm. And I do believe that eventually we will all need to come together and put together our resources to help our communities heal in a way that is going to actually move the needle. Right. I think we're moving the needle, but really kind of significantly. So that's that's where I'm torn and conflicted. Then I come back to the point of but the things that we are calling ourselves coaches around is real life stuff that people can feel harmed by and can really be detrimental to somebody's sanity. So if you're not really trained to deal with trauma, we don't need to touch trauma. We don't need to touch it. Maybe you can be an accountability person. Maybe you can be a motivational person. Maybe you can be somebody who uses your experience to say, hey, if you want to use my experience to get out of this, then here's what I did. You can take it or leave it. But to brand yourself as a trauma coach, a mental health coach, a divorce coach, I think it's all, I think it's all exploitive. I think it's oppressive and I think it's dangerous. So, you know, I stay away from it. And that is what I battled for a long time. What part of coaching do you want to do? And so I stayed away from nutrition. I said, what is it that I know how to do that still feels authentic to me and still feels like I'm not harming anybody, but is within my realm of understanding. And that's where I settled in on food relationship because I know relationship and I understand because I also have certification in nutrition, but I'm not a nutritionist, but I have certification there. So I did go to a coaching program and I said, so I understand relationship with food. I understand food enough to be able to coach around the dynamics of a relationship without talking nutrition. And that's what I think a lot of people kind of struggle with is that they want to be they want to have a slice of this, this pie that is moving and elevating mm-hmm. and getting a lot of attention that they are taking a slice any way they can. And I really do think that that's harmful in a lot of ways. 
Yeah, it's amazing, you know, and, and social media seems to produce a lot of people who really look the part because social mm -hmm. media really rewards people that are, are better at branding. And so oftentimes people that are focused on mastery, that are focused on serving, that are fo focused on their own development and building their capacity to help other people, branding is the last thing in their mind. They're just not that interested in that. But social media really rep really rewards and, and promotes people that are good at branding, good at creating content, good at controversy. Like if you say something controversial, just because it drives so much traffic, people love to argue on the internet, you know, that it'll, it'll take that stuff and put it directly in the front. And so people that look the part, sound the part, you know, also these things are so nuanced and they take so much time. Um, you know, to really just be immersed in, you know, that a one minute soundbite, the person that's going to craft a one minute soundbite, that's a very different skill from the person that's going to sit with you over the course of a couple years and actually help you understand yourself better and how what were the process that, that built the way that I see myself in the world. And yeah, it's amazing. It's incredible. And it's the processes that people don't understand. And it's the processes that we end up having those clients who come back and are harmed by the lack of understanding of the process. So they'll want to work with, of course, it's attractive. They want to work with the influencer. They want to work with the person who has the, the large audience. We like exclusivity. We're, we're attracted to feeling like we're a part of, of the in crowd. But when they go to those people for work, they don't get what it is that they thought they were going to get. And then they come back to us, licensed professionals, and then they talk about the harm that's been done to them. Or the the level of uh, disappointment that they feel that their expectations weren't met. Mm -hmm. So it ends up happening, but it happens behind the scenes. And that stuff you just don't see on social media because therapists aren't really going to say, well, I had this client come today and blah, 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 blah. They're not, we're not going to say that. So people don't know that this is happening. And so much of it, too, is, I, you know, I, I remember one of your posts recently that I really appreciate. I know my wife really appreciate it, is just you talking about the things that you will not do, like your own boundaries with your clients and with yourself. But just like I don't I don't open my, my calendar up for people to go in and move around their appointments. And, you know, but one of the things you said is I will never practice in a vacuum because I'm being expected to hold things that are larger than any one person should really be dealing with this. So there's the accountability piece, the, the, the fact that you've got other therapists that you can confer with, that you can check in with. Sometimes maybe there's like a, a therapist might have difficulty holding something that, they, that they're hearing. And so, you know, part of that licensure thing that I don't think people understand is just the ability to, to operate inside of a community. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And the accountability within that community. Yeah. Right. Because, I mean, if you start revealing your trauma to somebody and they ghost you, for example, I mean, that that's extremely re-triggering. Mm -hmm. that's, that's it. Then it's its own trauma. That adds oh, a new trauma, trauma to the. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Really challenging. You know, one of the things, I, other things I wanted to ask you about with regard to social media and just like you said, that that therapy is becoming more and more in vogue. You know, Kendrick Lamar has a whole, the, the whole new album. It just really feels like, okay, this is the therapy album from Kendrick. <laughs> you know what I mean? And, um, you know, hearing all these people talk about their journey with therapy. Um, and social media, I think it's particularly maybe TikTok, is really giving, it's almost like there's like disorders of the month that become really popular. And people start feeling like, they're diagnosing themselves with things like ADHD or mm -hmm. diagnosing their partners with being narcissists. Mm -hmm. <laughs> you know what I mean? There's like certain things that become really popular phrases. As, a, as an actual trained therapist, how do you feel when you see those things? <laughs> <laughs> like, I make posts about lighting, them lighting people up TikTok. argue with them. People, people mm. argue with me. So I had a post a couple, it must have been last year, and I was like, contrary to popular belief, everybody is not a narcissist. And so people were in the comment section, well, how do you know? And you know, the numbers, narcissists really won't go to therapy. So how are y'all getting those numbers? And I was like, we are so, so adamant about confirming what social media says that we no longer take what trained people say to be true as fact. Social media has to be right. 
Because if everybody is a narcissist, then that explains my experience. So I get where people are coming from. I get that they want the diagnosis to be true because it validates their experience and it gives them something to name when they didn't have anything to name before. So I get it. However, it's not true. It's not accurate. And without accurate information, you don't then know how to respond and show up yourself. So we're focused on labeling other people that we never begin to go inward to see what it is that we're dealing with that make us choose these people. Instead, we're just labeling and passing something on to people and projecting, right? So when I see stuff like that, I'm like, oh, this is why more of us have got to start putting out information because people are able to name and label anything. And if it sounds accurate, it's going to be accurate. It's going to be accurate. And now credibility has been given to folks with a lot of likes, credibility to folks with blue checks, credibility to folks who have influence. And so if she said it, if he said it, then it must be true. And this is the problem with mental health and the general public. So many things can be said to be true in the general public. And the general public takes it as true because they don't know any different. And so when I see things like that, I try to take it, I take it upon myself to debate it. I'll put a post out there. Everybody's not a narcissist. There's no such thing as a love addiction. <laughs> There's no such thing <laughs> as an abuse addiction. <laughs> right, you know? right, right. And people will or, get upset or, 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 with me. Or everybody thinks their thing is a trauma bond. Like yeah, so when people learn that word, it's like, bond. we have a trauma bond. Yeah, but love bombing. We have a trauma bond. I am, um, it, this is a trauma response. No, everything is not that. And I recently just made a post about suicide um, and depression and that most people understand suicide by understanding depression and everything does not result in a depression diagnosis. Well, that post people did not like a lot. People liked it, but then some people had a problem with it in that people only understand a limited amount of information. So the debate was that all of these things lead to depression. I was like, no, they don't. All these things are associated with depression, but they don't automatically lead to depression. And so people just, the the social media has done a great job of getting us into therapy, I think, and making therapy less stigmatized, but it's done so much harm in that it's giving us information that really doesn't exist. And so we're navigating this world with false information and trying to make sense of it with information that just isn't true. And that doesn't help us grow or heal either. It just helps us give another name to somebody or something. And now we're running around with several diagnoses that really just don't exist. And that does nothing for anyone. The Travelers Podcast has been rocking from day one with Sakat Foundation because of the fact that it's a humanitarian organization that operates all over the world in areas where people find themselves in crisis, in need, experiencing nightmares because they know that it's just part of the human experience that we're going to have these moments. Sometimes these moments are going to be a few weeks. Sometimes they're going to be a few years. Sometimes they're going to be a few decades. But it's part of the human experience that we have these times of need. And so human beings need to be there for each other. And the best experts on how to address these problems are the people that are experiencing themselves. So part of what speaks to me so much about Zakat Foundation is that the work is directed by the people on the ground. It's very easy for these big multinational corporations to come in and just throw their money around and throw their power around, especially because there's a sense of urgency, like you want to hurry up and just get resources to the people that need them because we care. But it's important sometimes to really focus on and talk to the people that are in these circumstances about what are your needs short-term, what are your long-term needs? What are the things that we need to be aware of to make sure that we don't end up contributing to the harm or doing more harm than good, you know, or just missing the context of what's going on. These things are really nuanced sometimes. Sometimes it's just as simple as like, okay, people need uh, food. Just give them food. People need, you know, resources. Just give them the resources. A lot of times it's more nuanced than that. So I'm really grateful to be rocking with people that are creative, 
that work with people on the ground. It's a Muslim-led organization, but they don't only help Muslims. They don't have the ulterior motive of proselytizing and converting people. This is all really very important, you know. So head to Zakat US on social media, Z-A-K-A-T US, to check out the work that they do or their website, zakatfoundation.org, and find something that speaks to you and support it. You know, jump in. Their orphan relief program, for example, you know, they none of the money that is donated for the orphan relief program and project specifically, none of that money goes to overhead. It doesn't go to advertising. It doesn't go to admin. It doesn't pay people, people's salaries. That fund specifically, 100% of the money goes directly to orphans and the people that are in their lives to making sure that they have what they need. Head to Zakat Foundation, find a way to jump in, and just know that I'm very grateful and honored to spread the word about such an amazing organization. One of the stigmas that we've always had is like, if I'm in therapy, that's me acknowledging that I am really damaged. Like I gotta be really, I gotta be like stabbing myself with the scissors at nighttime. Like to, to, like if I'm in therapy, I must be like trying to kill dogs in the weekends and like bury them in my backyard. I mean, the more exposure that I get, the more I realize like I feel like just the same way that everybody should have some sort of uh, some sort of relationship with exercise and movement. Everybody should have some sort of relationship with just thinking about what do I eat and what's right for my body. Everybody should have some sort of relationship with all of these health and wellness aspects of life. Do you think there's anybody that shouldn't or that doesn't deserve a relationship with therapy? No. The quick answer to that is I don't think that there's a person out there who could not benefit from therapy. The second part to that I'll say is that therapy is not for everybody. Therapy mm. in the sense of talk therapy. Uh-huh. Because when you don't have the language, if you don't have language, then how is therapy, how is talk therapy beneficial to you? So there are other forms of therapy. There's like yoga, there's play therapy, there's art therapy, there's music therapy, there's equestrian therapy. So therapy, excuse me, broadly, yes, but talk therapy is not for everybody. But therapy in some sense, I think there's, there's not a person on this planet who could not benefit from that. Unless you're just closed off and you just don't have the mental capacity to go there. Um, that's what I would say, you know, it's not doable. But if we're taking ability aside, disability aside, and people have the capacity, I don't think that there is a person on this planet who can't benefit from that. Because all of us kind of need to be thinking in a meta fashion. We need to be thinking cognitively about the the motivations and kind of urgencies or kind of underpinnings of what we do and why we do the things that we do. And that will give us great insight. And it actually breeds innovation. It actually breeds kind of us to think broadly about, about things and creation. So it helps us to kind of get unstuck and get out of our own way. So I think it's beneficial in a lot of ways. And it unlocks a lot of the things that, is, that have kept us stuck cognitively. So I do think it's beneficial, but just not talk therapy by itself. So you have Reiki, you have energy healing, you have astrology healing. So all of those things I think could work together to actually create create an experience for folks that could be beneficial. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. You know, I've, I've suggested therapy to friends of mine because I start to realize like, oh, this, this experience I'm having with you is a pattern that you have, you know, and it might be a pattern I have as well. Like we, a lot of times, you know, these relationships we find ourselves in, there's a codependent element to them. It doesn't mean the whole mm -hmm. relationship is codependent, but sometimes there's those elements and, you know, as a, as one person starts to heal, it's like, I'm not going to be able to participate in these unhealthy parts of this relationship anymore. Mm -hmm. And so the question then becomes, are we able to shift the dynamic of this so it's just the healthy part? Or is that really what was holding us together? But when I've, I've like suggested therapy to people, starting with the idea that like, yo, I've been in therapy and it's really amazing. And I, man, I really... And people are deeply offended by that. Like there are people that are really protective over the idea of not doing it. I wonder, what do you think are the major, um, are the major hangups for people or the major uh, difficulties for people when, with mm -hmm. the idea of, of going to therapy? I think it's that one of the main ones is that first one that you said, it's like the stigma, the thought that I have to be really 
really damaged to go to therapy. And if I go to therapy, I'm admitting that I'm damaged. Mm. I'm admitting that I can't handle my own stuff. Mm. And I think that that is huge for people who have been socialized to be the strong one, Mm -hmm. to be the one who is the fixer, to be the one who has it all together. Because if I have to admit that, then what does that mean about who I am? So I think a large part of that stigma um, keeps people away and it's misinformation, right? Also, I think historically we have to understand the field of mental health and what it's done to folks um, and why that stigma exists. So I tell people a lot of time in my talks, talk therapy actually started out as a way to keep black folks more civilized. How do we make them law-abiding citizens um, and people who don't just end up in jail? So when you have that history- They used to say well-adjusted. Well-adjusted. How do we make them more well-adjusted? When you have that history and you understand what that did to families, when you understand what that did to communities- and what, how that's been passed down, then you have to understand that that may be what some people are holding on to is that I don't want, um, I don't want, I don't trust the field. I don't want to talk to somebody who, who has been a source of pain for my family or a source of pain for my community. The other part to that is still, there's still harm being done in the field of mental health. I don't know if y'all saw this, but every now and then I'll take myself over there on one of those blogs. And there was a blog going around about compression socks. It was just that. It was just a picture of compression socks, the ones that you wear when you go to surgery. Under the comment section, everybody, most, most people were saying, Oh, I know what those are. Oh, I know what those are. I'm completely lost. I said, what is that? I read a little bit more. Those are the socks that they give people when they've been admitted to a psych ward. And so somebody said, last time I told my therapist how I felt, I ended up with those socks on. Mm. So there are people who are still being harmed by people in the field of mental health today. So just Mm. admitting that I sometimes think about hurting myself untrained therapists are going to send you off to be admitted. And that's going to create a negative experience for you. And most people under that post were saying, I'll never talk to a therapist again. I will never talk to a therapist again. And so their trust has been broken Mm -hmm. and they've been institutionalized for admitting something that was going on with them that somebody thought was more significant maybe than it was. So you have all of these things still happening for folks that we don't know. So we'll tell somebody, oh, you need to go to therapy without understanding what their experience was. Because way more people than we think are being institutionalized and they're not telling us. That's really helpful. Thank you so much for that. Mm -hmm. I have a a follow-up conversation to have with my buddy about that. Mm -hmm. Uh, what do you think are some of the big misconceptions about what therapy actually looks like? There's so Mm -hmm. much like you see, like, you know, um, we were just recently rewatching The Sopranos and there's so many times, like whenever my wife sees therapy on TV or on a movie, she's like, we have to fast forward this. I can't, I cannot, this is so cringeworthy. I can't do this. Yeah. But so what, what do you think are some of the big misconceptions and and what's, what are important for people to know about what therapy can actually look like? Yeah, so therapy historically has just been represented on TV through a white lens and mm-hmm. kind of a, a, that's the only way I can put it, a lens of whiteness that has been kind of like um, very conservative, very formal, um, very introspective, very quiet, very Freudian. So that is that in and of itself, just the representation that many of us see our introduction to therapy has been through TV that has been largely represented through through the lens of whiteness. So when people are coming to therapy, they are expecting to experience that. I can't tell you how many friends still call me today and say, Ebony, I need to come lay on your couch. I I don't have a couch anyway. <laughs> and so they're like, I need to come lay on your couch. But I'm like, what couch? But they think that therapy is supposed to be a couch where they lay and they just kind of free flow their thoughts. And so that's a misconception. And so if you go to therapy with someone and they don't have a couch, they're like, well, am I doing the right thing? There's also this idea that there is something that there's this role that you need to play to be in therapy. There's this client therapist role that needs to be happening and we need to be acting out in these ways. Right. So clients will come in trying to take on this role of what a client should look like until you give them permission to just be themselves. Right. And so they are coming in like, oh, I need to say this or I need to say this or I need to act like this. 
because my therapist is going to act like this. So that's a misconception. On the therapist side, too, many of us are playing therapists, the therapists that we think we should be. Mm. So it's not just clients. It's us, too. So we're mm-hmm. conservative. We sit upright. We take notes. We wear mm-hmm. the glasses. Speak we lean in. We say, mm-hmm. We speak real softly. <laughs> we say, mm-hmm. We say, now tell me more about that. Now tell me how. So we're acting, too. Right. And so that's a misconception is that you have to be a certain way in order to be in this work on either side. Also, there's a misconception that that therapy is going to work right away. And that you're going to feel these astronomically significant changes instantly, like you're going to leave every session with this aha moment. And I tell people from the very beginning, we may not see fireworks every session. You actually may not like me every session, but our job here is to do the work. And I also let people know, too, this may take longer than you expected. Because I don't want you to think that you're coming in here for four sessions, no matter what insurance tells you, this may not get worked out in four sessions. And so when it comes to being myself, because I had to find my own voice in therapy, too. So mm. now as mm. a therapist, I talk just I talk like I talk. And, I, yeah. and one of the things that has helped me to be authentic inside of therapy, too, has been social media. So I have a very real love-hate relationship with social media because yeah, clients, right. when they find me, I don't want them to say, you don't act like that in session. Right. You're two totally different people. Who we see you on social media as and who in therapy. Now, granted, there are some things that only is for session and only for social media, but for the large part, social media has helped me stay in my authentic voice. It's helped me to stay in my authentic line of thinking. It's helped me to stay authentic to what I believe so I can show up authentically as a therapist. I don't have to take on this conservative language that I thought I had to take on from grad school. I don't have to code switch Mm -hmm. in session. I can curse in session. I can call a thing a thing in session. I can say, you know what? That sounds crazy. That that is white supremacy. That is patriarchy. That is misogyny. That is racism. I can say those things where in grad school, we, we couldn't say those things. So I've been, I've given them, I've been given permission and power to be my true self in therapy. And I think a lot of therapists struggle with that and find their own voice and it's a journey. So I, you know, all of these things are playing into the whole therapy process. So when you talk about what are the things that are stigmatized and what are the things that I'm finding out, those would be the biggest, I would say. Mm-hmm. We hear so much about the idea of like finding the right, and I think one of the things that's really daunting, it was daunting for me, was finding the right therapist or like, how am I going to fight? There are so many different approaches and so many different styles and then so many different people. What's the process of finding the right person and how will I know? How will somebody know if they got the right therapist? That is a hard one. I tell people all the time, finding a therapist can feel like dating Mm. and dating is exhausting (laughs) because you have to understand that you're working with a person who is still a human still has a personality, still has a school of of thought that may be different than yours. So the way that they understand their own work is through that school of thought, through that framework. Mm -hmm. So I tell people, if you feel like you feel seen and heard, that may be a good place to start. But also don't be afraid to graduate from your therapist because what the purpose that the therapist serves now may not be the purpose that they serve then. You may have a therapist that just serves to help you get comfortable with the process of therapy. When you're ready to get deep into kind of like trauma work or really get deep into change work, you may need another therapist. And now you know exactly what you need because that person can't meet you at that deeper level. But you'll know, you'll know. And I tell people, we have gut reactions. You'll know if you feel seen and heard in that session. You'll know if you can feel like you can drop your shoulders. You'll know if you don't feel like you have to put on. You'll know is right if you feel like after a couple of sessions, you can start telling a little bit of the truth. Because I'm not, I'm not, <laughs> it's not lost on me that everybody does not start therapy telling the whole truth. Right. Um, so if you feel like you can start telling a little bit of your truth, right, you can start telling a little right. bit of what's actually happening. Right. You will know that the that's really the stuff that you're like, you know, on the real, though, I'm still yeah. looking at porn all the time. No, yes. Like I told my family, I don't anymore. <laughs> but, but I do yeah. it. it right, right. And that's OK. So mm-hmm. you'll, you'll know when you start to feel like you can show up as your authentic self over time. Mm-hmm. And if you feel like you're being judged, if you feel like you're being cut off, if you feel like you're being talked to, not talked to you know, with, then those are indicators that that's not a good person. If you feel like the advice or suggestions that you're getting just don't align with the way that you see the world, that's not a, that's not a good fit. 
Yeah, and I think so many hard. people don't realize that they, you know, especially people that have been treated like objectified by the mm -hmm. healthcare industries, you know, the complex that like you were mentioning. So many of us don't realize that like, I don't have to, this doesn't have to be my doctor. Like right. if I don't like the way this person talks to me, like this man doesn't have to deliver my baby That's or like right. this person doesn't have to, you know, this doesn't have to be my dentist. I don't like the way they, mm -hmm. whatever. They're mm -hmm. like, the, the, a lot of times we don't know that we have permission to, that we're actually auditioning, they're auditioning for us. That's right. Yeah. That's right. One that's of the right. things that people talk so much about is trauma. And that's like a, you know, a word that's come into people in, into the collective consciousness more and more. Um, and I, so, I mean, it's one of those things that we start using because we have a general sense of it. But what are some of the, what's kind of the language environment that you think is helpful to talk to about, about trauma mm -hmm. and describing, so, defining? I tell people, um, you have to leave it up to the person to define and de well, to label what they've experienced as traumatic. I was in an internship program where we had the the job of actually providing compensation and pension um, rulings and evaluations for, for veterans. And I remember strictly being taught that this is a trauma. This is a tragedy. What that person experienced was a tragedy. It wasn't a trauma. And I remember feeling like, who are we to tell somebody what was traumatic to them? And who are we to differentiate between tragedy and trauma as if they can't both exist at the same time? So that has always felt icky to me. So I lead with the idea now that trauma is something that has significantly disrupted your way of life. It's significantly disrupted the way that you do life and the way that you see the world, think about the world, experience the world. In any, and it can be traumatic. Now, there's a, a, dis, a like a qualifier that some therapists will put on it, and they call it big T, little t. And I only do that with folks to differentiate between what may be hierarchical for them, order of kind of significance for them. But it's not up to me. Like, although I'm the professional, it's not up to me to define something for you as just a tragedy and not a trauma. If you say it's traumatic, we're about to do some trauma work around it. And maybe you'll get to the place where you'll see, okay, this didn't disrupt things as much as I thought it disrupted. This was actually um, playing on something earlier, or this was something that is actually connected to something earlier that was even more traumatizing for me. But I think defining trauma is totally up to the person, and then it's up to us as professionals to talk about the way that trauma has impacted their life, and maybe that's where the diagnosis come in. But as far as labeling something as traumatic, that's totally up to the person who experienced that. I can't say whether that was traumatic, but I can say if you now have a diagnosis like PTSD or a diagnosis like uh, depression or anxiety, that is where my job is. My job is not on the front end of saying something wasn't traumatizing to you. What about what about on the other end? There are so many things that are normal to us because of mm -hmm. the fact that they happen so frequently. You know, I was in therapy. Me and my son were in therapy together, and the therapist would say, "You're not to my son. You're not defective. This is protective. You're not defective. This mm -hmm. is protective. They shouldn't have done so and so. Like this thing that happened to him. There mm -hmm. are things. He, I so I would see the way that he was treating my son, and I was like, "This is really beautiful," and then. When we were talking together, we he learned that it came out that one of my good, really good friends that when I was in high school that reminds me so much of my son was murdered, mm. and in like a way that like a similar path that I felt like my son was experimenting or was going in, down in this direction, and so he helped me understand like you have energy around what's happening here. It's life or death to you. He doesn't have context to this, so you just sound crazy to him. Because you're bringing this life and death energy to stuff that's just fun for him, or he's just exploring or expressing or whatever. And I was like, oh, okay, you know. But he does have trauma. But then he said to me, "And you're not defective; it's protective." And I'm just like, "Don't you start with that? <laughs> like, you stop that right now." <laughs> and he was like, "This is for him, not me." Yeah, and he was like, "They shouldn't have killed your friend." They shouldn't have killed your friend. And I was like, "Yeah, a lot of you know, a lot of people got killed. It was this so and so." Yeah, but they shouldn't have killed your friend. Mm -hmm. And I just like melted. I the, so the, and it's not just that. I think somebody thinks like, okay, one of my friends got murdered. That's trauma. Mm -hmm. But I mean, there are so many things that I've discovered that I never thought were traumatic. But mm -hmm. it's like, okay, mm -hmm. you 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 wanted your mom to be there for you when this thing happened, and you found out she couldn't be, 
And so that was an emotional abandonment. She didn't get up and leave you. She was still, you know, she was still putting food on the table and she was still, the, the, the lights were still on. She didn't leave. But there, there's a trauma there. So what about on the other end where people, where a lot of times we don't realize the things we're experiencing, our trauma, what are some, what are some ways that we might be able to understand that phenomenon? Mm -hmm. So I, I do a little bit of what your uh, therapist did, which is, which is really uh, significant. You name it, you label it from an authentic place. Like, oh my God, that sounds, that sounds horrible. That should never happen to anybody. That should never happen to you. You should have never been made responsible to take care of the house in that way. You should have never been made responsible. To, so we'll have those conversations. And I'll call it a lot of times, like, that sounds like you were in survival mode. And so once a person kind of understands, we'll say, well, now does knowing what trauma... So this is what it means to experience a trauma. It means that something significantly shaped or altered the way that you do life. Does that feel like that shaped how you do life? Does mm -hmm. that feel like that shaped... Now, how you show up in your relationships, has that, has that impacted the way that you now see the world? And if the answer is yes, then we say, well, that sounds like that may fit the definition of a trauma. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Does that feel traumatic to you? It's like, oh, no, because then the understanding of trauma means that it has to be aggressive. It has to be forceful. It has to be bloody. It has to be gruesome. Right. And so then we go into the understanding of, well, how do you define what a trauma is? Well, that was just my norm and other people experienced stuff worse than me. Okay. And so we we kind of walk it back to other people experience something worse because that's their world. And in your world, what you experience has that, has that shaped what you think. And so it takes a while for people to come around to the understanding that they may have experienced something traumatic because then they have to reckon with and reconcile that there was something that happened that was out of their control. Or there was something that happened bad to them that shouldn't have happened. Because this whole time they've told themselves another story. They've had another narrative. Right? And so it takes a while for folks to come around to experiencing a trauma because that means that there was something that happened to them and it can happen again. So now what do I do with that? So we just have we just have an open dialogue about that. Does that feel traumatic? If it doesn't feel traumatic now, we'll keep... We don't have to label it. We do. We are not married to the term trauma. What we can do is now talk about how that has impacted you and how that continues to show up without using the word trauma. So as a psychologist, even though I am licensed, I can diagnose, I don't even leave with diagnoses in my session because who does that help? If the person is not wanting the diagnosis or concerned about the diagnosis, let's just talk about how this helps or how this shows up for you and how you can help yourself move past and beyond these things. There's no need to harp on um, a term if it's not beneficial for the person. For some people, they need to know that this is BPD or borderline personality disorder. They need to know that this is OCD or things like that. But for people who don't, okay, let's just talk about how this impacts you now and what this looks like in behavior. Mm -hmm. One of the things I heard you say recently is that so many people have this idea that if you come to therapy and you start talking about your trauma, it means that you're going to have to relive that in every session. Mm -hmm. Like you're mm -hmm. just going to every time and then, and then what did he do? And then what, and then what happened? Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. And I think for a lot of people, I mean, I, I certainly thought that I certainly thought that I was going to have to tell these stories and relive them and try to revisit them all the time. Um, but you were saying that with a lot of in a lot of cases that might not be the way forward for people. Yeah. What because are some of the other ways that yeah, what are some of the other ways that you that 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 you can really work on trauma without having to constantly be, you know, re experience it? Mm -hmm. so one of the other ways is let's talk about how it's impacted you. What areas mm -hmm. has this impacted you and how does it show up now? Those mm -hmm. are some of the most effective uh ways to work through trauma because honestly is not so much the memories that keep us kind of stuck. It's what we think about and are telling ourselves about what happened. Mm -hmm. It's what we tell ourselves about ourselves. It's what we tell ourselves about others. It's what we tell ourselves about the power that we have, the weaknesses. It's what we tell ourselves about what is going to happen. So mm -hmm. what is the meaning that we've made mm -hmm. of this experience? That is where the work is. It's not the experience itself. It's the meaning that we've made of it. Right. And and that's why, you know, when you're saying that, like, it's not for us to say that something is or isn't traumatic, a specific thing. This is people saying this is tragic, but it's not traumatic because it's 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 really less about the event and more mm -hmm. about the way that it impacted us. That's it seems right. like there, there's a there's a relationship to like, you know, a person lives life with certain assumptions like, um, 
you know, if I'm with my uncle, I'm probably safe with the because mm-hmm. this is a family member. And then something happens and it's like it shatters that version or, or of reality. And so like, well, if I'm not here, if, if this thing that I always thought was safe is very unsafe, then what does it say about everything else that I think might be safe? And then, you know, and then also, like you said, what does that say about me? Because maybe one of the responses that I have is like, if I can somehow figure out how I'm, how I make this my fault, then it means that I did something wrong. And if Mm -hmm. I don't do that thing or wrong again, then this won't happen to me again. I can stop it from happening to my children. If I, if I am like a self victim blamer, you know Mm -hmm. what I mean? Then I can, I can work my way around this. Yeah. Well, that's protective, right? Right. That's protective. So if mm. I can, if I am somehow can re- convince myself that I could have done this or I should have done this, and there was something that somehow could have changed and stopped this from happening, then I can stop it again. So it's mm-hmm. protected. I can stop it from happening to me. I can stop it from happening to somebody else. And it gives me control where I feel like I didn't have control or where I might not have control. So a lot of the issues that we see in trauma survivors, honestly, it are issues of control. You know, and that shows up in body manipulation, that shows up in food manipulation, shows up in ways that we navigate relationships and ways that we parent, who we choose to be uh, partners with. All a matter of how do I keep myself from experiencing that thing again? How do I keep myself from trusting people who can't be trusted? Mm-hmm. Yeah. You, so much of what, what, what you mentioned there, um, you know, and I heard you say this recently too, that it's very difficult for people. Sometimes you'll find people have a spark of energy at the beginning of therapy mm-hmm. because it's like, yeah, I'm about to. And it's, I mean, it's definitely that way with a lot of, you know, long form or like long, uh, like marathons. Like mm-hmm. at the beginning of anything like that, it's like, I'm about to get in shape. You know what I mean? And you go work out and you're sore, you're sore the next day. And then, you know, day three, you start getting a little ad- adrenaline and endorphins and stuff like that. You're like, this is amazing. This is how I live now. Mm-hmm. And then you, you hit this period where it's like, oh man, this is, I got to do this tomorrow and the next mm-hmm. day and the next day and the next day. And you were saying that so many times people will start feeling a different way about therapy a little ways in because it starts to shift the relationships that people have with each other and like, well, where, where is this going to lead my relationships? And like, how am I going to, what is it about, um, you know, we, we talk so much about narcissists, but so many of us mm-hmm. are people pleasers. Mm-hmm. So many of us have this vision and view of ourselves that, that we're really just like altruistically giving to everybody. Mm-hmm. And like, I'm just generous and I'm, I serve people and I'm not greedy and I'm not a narcissist and I'm not stingy and I'm not, you know, and then we find ourselves hitting these walls where like we almost can't be in the relationship anymore. So we got this like Mm -hmm. this graveyard of relationships where we thought we were giving, 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 and then Mm -hmm. bump up against what our needs were. And the fact that getting our needs met was never a conversation even for us. Mm -hmm. Um, So what, what do you come across and what's the advice that you give people with regard to these types of relationships? You know, I tell people we build relationships. This is one of my favorite things to talk about. We build relationships mm-hmm. off of who we are at the moment. Mm-hmm. We build them off of who we know ourselves to be and who we know another person to be mm-hmm. at the moment. When we go to therapy and we start doing healing work, we transform. And the foundation that those relationships were built on can no longer hold who we are becoming if people aren't willing uh, to do the work. And even if they are willing to do the work, we have to reestablish that foundation. We have to go back in, reestablish that foundation. So a lot of times people pleasing really is about protection. How do I get people to stay around? How do I get people to like me? How do I avoid shame responses? How do I avoid feeling guilty from for not doing things for people if all I was taught was that I should be doing things for people? How do I do that? So this identity that I've developed around being a giver, a servant. If I don't do that, then who am I? Right? So you go to therapy and you realize, oh, that's not actually who I am anymore. That hasn't served me in the ways that it used to. What now do I do? I set boundaries, but people aren't going to like that. So then what happens to those relationships? They change. People become upset. It's hard to navigate. You lose people and that is that loss is hard to deal with. So I tell people, 
when they come to therapy, you know, relationships will shift. Understand that this work is hard. I deal with it myself. I'm dealing with it myself mm-hmm. now. Relationships mm-hmm. will shift. Um, mm-hmm. How do you you navigate that? You can kind of either adjust your expectations around what you are expecting from another person. Because sometimes we will go to therapy and do our work and then come home and tell people, you need to go to therapy. Right. It's not their right. time. Right, it's right, not right, their right, time. Right. <laughs> and so we try to force our healing onto people. <laughs> you know, right. well, you just right. need to go to therapy. Well, you just need to do something about your expectations of what this person has to give you now mm. that you know that you've shifted. Mm-hmm. This person has not shifted yet. So instead of forcing them to do something because you're in a different place, how do you adjust to what they have the capacity to give you at this moment? That's part of the work. The other part of the work is now. If you know that this situation no longer serves you, is this something that is still beneficial for you? And if you're not ready to let go of it, how can you still engage in this situation from a place that still honors you? Because mm-hmm. just because you realize it doesn't mean you really, you're really you ready to let go of it. So how do you engage from a place that, that honors you? And I tell people, things exist on a spectrum. If you have a friend who you feel like doesn't give to you, mainly, sometimes that's because we didn't create that friendship with the with the requirement that that person knows how to pour back into us. So if you're at a place now where you're not ready to give up that friendship, how do you navigate it knowing exactly what this person can give you? Mm-hmm. You can either create an associateship relationship with them. You can create um, a person who you travel with. You don't have to keep this person as a close friend. You don't have to keep telling them all of your secrets. You don't have to keep pouring into them. But what part of the spectrum do you now want to move on since you now know what is what is um, available to you from this person as a resource. And then we have conversations about that. So I tell people when you're going, you know, the advice that I would give is to adjust your expectations about what's going to happen. Mm-hmm. Adjust your expectations about who you are going to be, who they're going to be, and what they're able to give you, what you're able to give. Because the relationship dynamics will change. And be willing to do the work that comes with change. And it's hard, hard work. And it's a lot of grief that that is involved in it. So that would be the main thing that I would I would tell people and suggest and just kind of do some some more discussion around. Yeah. You know, from the outside looking in, it 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 seems as though, and especially this is another one of the things that on social media, you see that people just get twisted. You know mm-hmm. what I mean? Where you see basically all of these memes about people ending their relationships, mm-hmm. how many people they cut, how proud they are that they cut this many people off. And like, you know, I, I, you know, I, I don't give a damn. I don't care what anybody said, what I said. I don't care what anybody thinks and all this stuff. Yeah. And, you know, I had to cut all these toxic people off and things like this. And you wonder like, so there, there was a part of me that anything that came up in therapy, I was just like, I'm not interested in cutting everybody off. Yeah. You know, but what I what I started to learn along the way is that a lot of times as 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 the stories I was telling myself about these relationships, about how pure my intentions were, and I'm just here Mm -hmm. to be a giver is actually a lot more. There's a lot of uh, unacknowledged stuff within me that like I'm looking for validation from this person. You know what I mean? And another person could never validate me. So I was actually accepted. Yeah. So I'm, I'm coming into this relationship like. You don't have to do anything. And it's like, actually, the thing that I'm unknowingly asking them to do is impossible to do. Right. Because they right, can't right. make me feel like, a, like, a, like I'm somebody. But that's, that's right. what I, you know. And then the other part was like, um, if I do all this thing, all these things for you, you can't reject me. Mm. You know what I mean? You'd be horrible to reject me. So, so it's like right. this, this natural human just reality of creation that people, not all relationships last forever. It's not a that's failure right. if they don't go forever. You know, yeah, and then that's also, good. Mm. that's really good. Go ahead. I hate when people say a failed marriage. There's something oh, I like, like it really bothers me that like these people be together for twenty years. They they raise two kids, and then they just go their separate ways. Like, how's mm-hmm. that a failure? Yeah, and I, I was married once too. Uh, so this is my second marriage that I'm in now, and I was tell- like, I don't I don't think I had a fail. My first marriage was not a failure. We just were people who were young. I got married when I was 25, 26. We were young, and it served the purpose that it served then. I'm Muslim. It I no got married at 17. You're an amateur. That's not a- <laughs> <laughs> you got married That's not young. That's third marriage in Islam. What are you talking about? You know what? <laughs> that was young for me because, remember, I needed to get through school first. Right, I needed right, to get right, through right. school. I needed- Then just, I was going to go off and build a family. <laughs> no, I'm just messing with you. Yeah, no, it's real. No, 25 yeah. is still- 
Yeah. That's young. I look at my 25 year old cousin now and I'm like, they let me, they let me talking about my parents and my aunts and uncles. Y'all let me go off and live a full adult life. And I was just a child myself. I had literally just graduated from college. I was not ready to be anybody's anything. I didn't even know who I was and y'all let me get married. So I don't think it was a failure. I think it was a chapter and we served the purpose that it was supposed to serve and we outgrew each other. This episode of the Travelers Podcast is sponsored by BetterHelp, and we get a commission when you use our link to sign up with them. You know, in talking to Dr. Ebony, um, it, it is really clear that if you live in Texas, if you live in Austin, and if you can walk into Dr. Ebony's office and she's set up to take your type of insurance and you have insurance and you can talk to her, that's ideal. But a lot of us don't have that. I don't have that opportunity. Even though my wife is a therapist, I live outside of America. And a lot of people's license, uh, the the ordinances and the rules about the licensing where they live don't make it possible for me to just connect with a therapist. So I heard about BetterHelp online therapy platform on a podcast that I listened to. And so I used their link to go to the to go to their site. I got a discount because of the fact that I was referred by one of their partners, and it took me directly to a questionnaire. So for you hearing this, if you're interested, you go to betterhelp, B-E-T-T-E-R-H-E-L-P dot com slash travelers. And that way you'll get a discount for being referred by us. They also will send some resources our way to help the work that we're doing on the Travelers Podcast. And you go and you fill out their questionnaire that'll ask you, what is it that's bringing you to therapy? Do you want to deal with addiction and substance abuse and dependence? Uh, Do you want to deal with relationship stuff? Do you want to deal with, you know, family issues? Do you have trauma that you want to work through? Um, You know, what is it that's bringing you to therapy? And then also, what are your preferences for the therapist that you talk to? You know, do you want to talk to a, um, you know, a, a therapist from a certain community. That stuff really matters because we have to be able to speak a common language with the therapist that we talk to. We've got to trust that they understand our context, our situation in society. Those things really matter. And, and BetterHelp gives you the option of talking to somebody from a particular background or with a particular identity. And then you choose you start talking to a therapist right away. A lot of times they show you different profiles of therapists and you choose the one that sounds right to you. And then you start texting with them right away. You get immediate access to their their calendar and you plug in when do you want to talk to your therapist. And you choose if you want to talk to them on the phone or if you want to see them face to face on the you know on their 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 portal. So you're you're seeing each other and talking to each other. And then at any point, if you want to change your therapist because it just doesn't feel like a match, no questions asked. You just change therapist. Um, so my own journey has really included better help, and it's meant a lot to me. Immediately when I started talking to my therapist, I don't know if they gave me the option to choose a therapist or if I just didn't do that, so they assigned me somebody. But I ended up choosing a therapist that I don't know if I would have chose or not. But in my first session with her, She was asking me questions, uh, reflecting what I was saying back to me in ways that just allowed me to see myself and my journey with these issues that I have in a new light. And it was directed by me. She just was asking me questions. How do you feel when these relationships fall apart? I feel invalidated. Okay. So if when relationships go bad, you feel invalidated, maybe in these relationships you were seeking... Oh, validation. Okay, so what is it that has you seeking validation? Why do you think you might be seeking validation from other people? Oh, maybe because of this and this and this and this and this. All right, let's explore that. Tell me more about that. (laughs) You know what I'm saying? So it was a major revelation to me. Also, it's, it's not cheap, you know, but it's affordable. And like I said, you get a discount for using our link. 
better help b e t t e r help h e l p dot com slash travelers. Go there, fill out the questionnaire, and get started on this journey in therapy. Hearing you use the term food relationship. Strategist, food relationship coach. There, that's such an enlightening phrase just for that term to exist in the world. It's so generous and so educational just for that to hear that term. The idea of relating to food, the, the understanding food as a relationship, mm-hmm. and so looking at it like any other relationship. Is this healthy? Like if I was hanging out with a person that was going to beat me up and the next day I had bruises on my body and the next day I felt bad and I felt bad, my physically felt bad and felt bad about myself, I would probably know that this is not a healthy relationship. Mm -hmm. Okay. But what if it's like, what if all the like pizza and ice cream and all that stuff, the next day I get up feeling physically bad, I feel emotionally bad. You know what I mean? Just the idea, this introducing that concept of food being a relationship was so big to me. Yeah, um, yeah. How did you arrive at that at that particular language? Even yeah, I tell people it's always uh, it's always funny to me, but I actually made that up. I knew mm-hmm. that I didn't want to be a wellness coach uh, because I felt like after I had read the book uh, "Fear in the Black Body" by Sabrina Strings, I said I don't want to do this. I think this is uh, oppressive. I don't want to be a wellness coach. I think the field of wellness is co-opted. I think that is um, it's exploitive. And I don't want to be, I don't want to be lumped in with people who just create meal plans. I'm so much more than that. Not that anything is wrong with that, but the level of knowledge that I have to bring to this issue is yes. so much more significant right. than just what somebody eats and the and what's on their plate. Yes, so I said, I want to focus right. on relationships. Mm-hmm. I know that black women have a relationship with their hair. We have a relationship with our, our beauty, we have a relationship with so many things. So why is it not a relationship with food that people are talking about with us? Why is it not a relationship with our body that people are talking about with us? So I started saying I'm a food relationship coach. And then it moved to strategist because I just didn't want to be lumped in as a person who has a fix all for everybody. I wanted to be a person who is still exploring. I wanted to be a person who was still trying to understand this myself too and understanding that it doesn't look the same for all of us and that what fits yeah. at one time is not mm-hmm. going to fit at another time. Even my own thinking about a relationship with food has shifted. If you read, I have a book out there, Food is Not Bay is the book. That's where the podcast name came from. But if you read the first seven chapters of that book, it's heavily rooted in weight loss, diet culture rhetoric. And the second half, you can see where my whole mindset shifted to where it's now food relationship based. Right. So I was like, some parts of me are still evolving. So I can't call myself a coach because that felt like I knew it all already. And so I wanted to call myself a strategist because I'm still exploring. I'm still trying to figure this thing out right along with the people that I'm wanting to work with. There's also something about the term strategist as opposed to coach that really feels like that really indicates like what a long and, you know, never ending process this really is. Mm -hmm. And that was Mm -hmm. one of the big things that hearing you say really, really touched me because I think of myself as a disciplined person, you know, like being a Muslim, like I can fast for 30 days, mm-hmm. like, no, I do it every year. I love it. I love doing it. And then mm-hmm. at the end of that 30 days, it's like, I'm going hard. Like I'm about oh, to yeah. make up for those 30 days, oh, yeah. you know? Oh, yeah. And I've started to recognize in myself that like 30 days is about my threshold, you know, for, for, mm-hmm. for, for doing, putting on some new regimen, I can do it for 30 days. And then after 30 days, it's going to fall apart. But you saying, I think you said it was three years. Mm-hmm. You know, to, to to take that amount of time and to give somebody them so that long. And that has really been so um, transformative for me mm-hmm. because I lost a bunch, like being in Istanbul, walking, eating better food. I got a, I got a, you know, a trainer, my wife's on board, like we're, we're all doing this. But then I went back to the U.S. to go on tour for six months and like all that stuff that I built around me is gone. And I'm in situations that I, I don't know what to do about this. And there's all these temptations. All, all my favorite foods are there and stuff. It's hard to go to, the, you know. And, and so to to start gaining some back and feeling myself going the other direction, but to realize like, no, this is a long, I'm, I didn't, this isn't a failed marriage. Like, you know what I'm saying? Like, yeah. I, this is a, this is a part of the journey. Um, right. And so I wonder when you talk about just that relationship with time, and slowing slowing it down and understanding that it's a long-term thing. Um, I think that's so 
so important and so necessary. And can you talk a little bit about with regard to that and and so much the the idea that diet culture really is the enemy of being healthy? Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. So if you talk, if you think about just the relationship period, right? Mm-hmm. Most of us, even though we know that some relationships will, will end, most of us enter relationships with the idea that this is going to be long term to some degree, right? So when you think about a food relationship, it didn't dawn on me until later that I was like, why did not? T- why is it that I thought that this would rectify itself in thirty days? I don't go into any of my other relationships thinking that this is going to end in 30 days or this is going to end in marriage in 30 days. So why would I not think that way about food? And it's because diet culture has told us something very different. Diet culture has told us that it's a quick fix to any problem that we have and they have the remedy and we don't have to spend that much time on it. And the reason that it's an enemy is because it plays on our desperation. It's harmful. It's exploited. It, it, if you think about being in a relationship with a person and you said, I am desperate to find somebody to marry. And they said, well, I got a solution for you. I'll marry you in 30 days. You would call that person a predator. You would call that person mean. You'd say, you played me. You played on my emotions. You knew I was desperate. You didn't have any intention on making this thing work. So after 30 days, yeah, you married me, but then you left me on the 31st day. Or you started to to like leave me and leave me kind of like ending for myself or chasing you or whatever by day 45. That's the same thing that diet culture tells us. You're going to lose the weight. You're going to develop a routine in 30 days. But what happens on that 31st day, that's not up to us. That's on you. And in that way, it's harmful. In that way, it's the enemy because it really doesn't set you up for long-term success or sustainability. It sells you a promise and then it drops you cold. Mm -hmm. And anything Mm -hmm. else that comes after that, they blame you for it. So if Mm -hmm. you're in a relationship with a person who's like, well, I married you in 30 days. I did what I said I was going to do. It's on you now that you believe that. That's on you that you thought that I was going to be here. So it victim blames, right? So diet right. culture does the exact same thing. It's not our fault that you gain weight after 40 days. You're just not disciplined enough. You don't have the motivation enough. It's just not in you. Or you let life get in the way. And so it does something to you. And then it blames you for what it did to you. And that's why I think it's harmful and it's abusive. It's just like a relationship with another person. You know, that's one of the things that I remember, I can't remember which Donald Goins book it is, but he basically is saying that in the beginning, in the beginning, the book starts with two people that are going to run a con on somebody. And one of them is like the younger con artist and he's being schooled by the older one. And he's like, isn't this wrong what we're doing to people? And the elder con artist basically says all cons work because you're offering somebody something that's too good to be true, Mm -hmm. that they didn't actually want to put the work in for and so you offer them something too good to be true. And at the, that's how the con artist sleeps at night is by telling themselves that like, ultimately this is this person's fault. You know what mm-hmm. I mean? That, it, that it's their problem that they were, you know? Mm-hmm. And um, so what are some of the, I, I, like, I, I want to make sure that we really leave people with yeah. all of your actual resources. You've been giving us so much just free advice and wisdom and education. I want to make sure that we we really get to that and that we have all of that mm-hmm. stuff easily accessible and available for people to be able to really benefit from from the things that you've put into the world. But can you talk a little bit about some of the principles and some of the guiding overarching themes about what a healthy relationship with food looks like? I know you like I, I love the fact that when I first hit part play on the on the podcast, it was like how to have a donut without the guilt. And I was like, oh okay, I'm in the right place. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I want to have a donut a relationship, the Yeah, a relationship with food is not about the food. It's mm. not about the food. And this is what I want people to understand. When you're in a relationship, you're focused on the qualities. Yeah, on a superficial level, like we are attracted to people and that kind of thing. But that ends up wearing off. Okay. When you're in a sustainable relationship, it's about your ability to negotiate, your ability to handle conflict, the values that y'all share, the morals that y'all share, the qualities that are appealing, the sustainability, what's going to help this thing work. How are they there for you? How are you there for them? So the relationship with food is actually not about food at all. It's about the qualities of the relationship that you have. Is it one that makes you feel anxious? Is it one that makes you feel guilty? Is it one that makes you feel shameful? Or is it one that empowers you? Is it one that makes you feel autonomous, independent, filled with joy? Those are the relationships that we want. And if you can go quality first, 
value first, it really doesn't matter what piece of food you pick up. It really doesn't matter. So if I'm leading with joy, I'm typically not going to eat things that make me feel sick, whether that's kale or whether that's a donut. Go the ahead. thing that happens for us, though, is mm. that diet culture tells us that donut is the sickness. They never tell us that kale also makes you sick. They categorize food as good or bad, and that is what we tie our morals, our own character judgment on. Well, if I eat mm. kale, which is a superfood right now, then I'm good. If I eat donut, then I'm if I eat a donut, then I'm bad. So a lot of the relationship with food is hinged on or kind of depends on how you are judging yourself based on the food that you've been taught to categorize. And so a healthy relationship with food is leading value first and letting that determine how you show up with food. If you're leading value first in a relationship with a person, you're going to let that guide who you choose. Mm -hmm. And you're going to, you're going to be so solid in who you choose that your mama can't say anything about it. Your friends Uh can't say anything about it. But if you're not solid, then you're going to be swayed by, Oh, my my mama don't like them. He doesn't, she doesn't like him. But if you are, this person treats me this way, we have these shared set of values, then you're going to navigate that relationship in a totally different way. So the way that I approach a healthy relationship with food is let's lead with values, let's lead with qualities, see how that makes you feel overall. Then we will decide which foods fit within that. Because at times, a pizza is exactly what I need. At Mm -hmm. times, a salad is exactly what I need. And there are times when I can't eat kale because kale makes me bloated. There are times when kale brings me absolute misery. So why do I need to eat that? Because that is making, you know, it's just like a person. If this mm-hmm. person is making you miserable, why are you continuing to show up with them? Because they look good to other people and they, they get me clicks and likes. People. And yeah, I get likes on Instagram. Yeah. Cause, that cause, part, right? Yeah, because he has this car. She has this booty. It's like this That's has right. this, yeah. Mm-hmm. That's right. And so we get lost in the we get lost in the fluff that we really mm-hmm. don't have a solid understanding of what works for us and what mm-hmm. doesn't work for us. And the, building a healthy relationship with food is learning to listen to what your body is telling you about the foods that you eat. How is your body responding to that? How are you responding to that? Because it's a total it's a total dynamic. What you eat influences how you act, how you behave, what your body does. So what is the what is your body giving you? emotionally, mentally, physically, spiritually, what is your body responding um, in this way? One of the things that I tell people also to build a healthy relationship with food that a lot of us have to work through the traumas that still exist in our bodies. Yes, 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 yeah. And so traumas come in and wipe away our abilities to feel connected mind and body. Sometimes we're totally living in our heads. Sometimes we're totally living in our bodies and we can't tell a gut reaction from a trauma response. So A lot of the work around building a healthy relationship with food is removing ourselves from scarcity and survival mode and learning how to feel settled in a way that trauma has not allowed us to feel settled. Maybe we grew up in a food desert. Maybe we grew up being pacified by food. Maybe we grew up with body harm or harm being done to our physical physical bodies, right? So how do we feel settled enough to trust the body to tell us what it likes and what it doesn't like? So that's a large part of the initial work is how do you get settled in your body enough to then make decisions that feel authentic to you or that feel joyful? Because a lot of times when you're still experiencing trauma in your body, you can't feel joy anyway, whether that's with food, whether that's with a person, whether that's with yourself, it just is not there. So how do you find that? And that does require some level of therapy. Yeah. It's a lot. One of, one of the things that I repeated, I think that maybe maybe the part that you heard that I, that because I, I think I've mentioned you a few times, but I think the episode you may have heard mm-hmm. is when I was just saying that one of the things that really led me to therapy was this idea that you were talking about on the on the Food Is Not Bay podcast, where, where you were saying that so often we eat just because we don't, like we want to take control. We don't have coping skills mm-hmm. for feeling lonely or angry or sad or, or you know, and so, or anxious or, or, you know, so it's like, well, if I eat, and even if I feel bad about what I ate, at least I've taken mm-hmm. control over what I'm feeling. And so learning those coping skills is, is one of the major, one of the major keys. Mm-hmm. And a lot of us just don't have them. A lot of times food was the only resource that we have. If we go back to the conversation around therapy and therapy resources and uh, stigma, sometimes food was the only way that we knew how to feel better. So there's a historical component to our relationship mm-hmm. with food and ways and reasons why we don't diversify our coping skills. 
That was all we had many times. So now the work is how do I gain more skill that is not just rooted in food or not just rooted in drink or that kind of thing? How do I actually start to move my body in ways that feel good to me and not just to lose weight? How do I actually start to honor my body in in asking it, do you want to stretch today? Do you feel like running today? Do you want to do nothing today? Because a lot of that stuff too, the way that we work out is a a prescribed like plan. Right? You do this, you do you do cardio on Monday, Tuesday, and we're not even thinking about what our bodies want to do. So getting back to that place of, you know, what is, what is this telling me? What do I want to do here? What is my body telling me that I want to do? And working our way back, because sometimes it's just not there for us. You've been so incredibly generous. This was really, really dope. I really appreciate it so much. Um, I want to make sure that we talk about all of the all of the ways that people can interact with you and engage you and also support your business. I know, um, I I really would like to hear you say something about my therapy cards. Yeah. Uh, So I created the cards. Actually, it was supposed to be a food relationship deck at first, Mm. but because of the pandemic, we we pivoted um, because I also have a marketing coach and we pivoted and we were like, this deck needs to come out first because of what we're experiencing. So my therapy cards was created for black women specifically because of the amount of turmoil and hell that we just experience all the time. And I was like, let me give us something that we can have during this very difficult time where we feel like we're carrying so much and advocating for everybody else but ourselves. So it started out with me creating questions that I ask people every day in session. I said, let me put it in the in a deck because as you know, your wife can only practice where she's licensed, right? So I said, let me give people questions and tools to where they feel like if they want to talk to Dr. Ebony, they can talk to me even if they are not residents of Texas. So I put the questions that I ask inside of a deck and I said, now people can actually have questions that I ask in therapy and they can get a feel for what it would be like to talk to me. Or if there's still some stigma, they can get a feel for what it would be like to talk to a therapist. What are the questions that therapists are asking? Because like we said earlier, most of our introduction is TV. So here are the questions that therapists will ask. They don't, they're not asking all this, this other stuff. They're asking things like this. And that alleviates people's anxiety and stress about going to therapy. And also, let me give people something that they can actually afford. Because everybody can't pay my asking yes. rate per hour. That's right. Right? So let me give people something that they can actually afford where they can do some work that is actually meaningful. So that's how they came about. Simple as that. What's your favorite question that's in the deck? Oh, one card? that I have to put the deck down myself. I, every time <laughs> I get to this question, I'm like, oh, I don't want to answer uh, it. But it's uh, the question of what do you need to forgive yourself for? Every single time. Every single time. And I'm like, I don't want to answer this question. But it's what do you need to forgive yourself for? And the and it, that's, in, that's in the women's deck. It's in the men's deck. It's not in the teen edition because I just don't want to imp- and sort of plant this idea of just regret, shame, guilt, responsibility on people who don't have the capacity to think that much. Mm. Um, so I put it in the adult versions, not the teen version. So that question gets me every time. And it seems like there was a lot of thought and intention put into specifically how the cards look and also how they mm-hmm. feel. Like there's mm-hmm. a somatic, there's like a very calming thing about the way that the cards look and also how they feel. And and I'm just imagining this, but the way that black women can see themselves depicted in these cards, like it looks very bright, it looks very healthy, it looks very like mm-hmm. open and dignified and happy and at ease. And mm-hmm. can you say something about the design of the cards? Because it's really, really dope. And for somebody to have hit it out of the park like that on their first production, you mm-hmm. killed it. You killed it. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. I wanted to see myself reflected. Simple Mm. as that. I -hmm. wanted to see myself reflected, especially being a person who's come through this field and the only representation you have is that of white women, of white men. I wanted to see myself reflected. Um, So a part of that was I want to see people talk to Dr. Ebony and I want to have people see see me and I also want to see myself. How do I look? How do I feel? What would I want to see as a consumer? So I took both sides, right? But honestly, I just wanted to see myself reflected in the work. And I wanted people to be able to say, she's fly. She looks like me. Because one of the things I know about marketing that I've had to learn outside of grad school is that if people feel like they can, they feel like it resonates with them because they can see themselves in you and the work that you do, that makes them trust you also a little bit more. So that's why authenticity is so, so um, significant and, and important for me. 
I wear the jumpers, the blue jumpers with the spaghetti straps. I, I, I like the plants. I wear my hair in a bob. I've had a bob hairstyle before. So all of these are things that I actually do and how I actually look. And I wanted people who like that aesthetic to be like, okay, that's me. I can see that because then they see themselves in the work that they can do and it provides a safe space for them to do that work. So that was really important to me when I went to the teens, which I think is very important. I could have easily used the same images, but because black girls are so adultified and made to look older than what they are, I wanted them Mm. to have a deck that allowed them to be children, that Mm. allowed them to be girls. I didn't want a deck Mm -hmm. where they look like grown women. Mm -hmm. So I said, they need their own deck, they need their own questions, and it needs to be age appropriate. And so I sought out illustration that actually looked like young girls because Mm. of the adultification of black girls. That's so rampant. And for black men, I wanted them to see themselves in a facet of ways. I wanted them to see the locks. I wanted them to see the the conservative, like, look, the low cut, the shave, the beards. I wanted them to be able to see themselves reflected um, in their work as well. So that was all important to me and very intentional, um, too. And so when we come out with our additional versions, I, I just wanted to be continuously intentional. I want folks to be able to see themselves. I want images that that are body positive, body inclusive. I want to see um, questions that are more uh, gender inclusive. So these are all the ways that we're we're continuing to grow with the line. And I'm just so, so grateful that this work was able to come through me because I don't even know <laughs> like how it actually came to fruition in that time that it did, but it was perfect. And I'm happy that I was listening. I'm happy that I was obedient and I'm happy that I was in position to actually create something like that for folks to use. Man, we're happy and grateful. Food is not Bay, B A E, is the <laughs> is the the publication, the book, and the podcast. I know you were saying that you you know haven't haven't added new episodes recently, but for somebody like me that just finds it now, mm-hmm. it's like there's a lot there. Like you really have been very very generous in 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 that space. Um, how would you what how would you like people to to think about going into that book and that podcast? Absolutely. I would say listen to the podcast first. Mm. The podcast is a place where I actually, I think I really do share my heart on a lot of issues, whether it's Mm -hmm. true for me now or not. I share what was my truth at that time. And I think that it gives folks a sense of my framework by which I approach a relationship with food. Um, And they can find it anywhere they listen to to podcasts. Um, And just start there. Listen to it. Take what works. Leave what doesn't. Um, And follow me on Instagram kind of check me out to see what what questions you have. I'm always talking to folks in the DM anyway. So let me know if there's a question that you have, but I really will ask uh, and encourage folks, listen to the podcast, then maybe read the book if you you want to. Uh, but I think the podcast has such a, a vast amount of information that that's a great place to start. So people who people who live in Texas can hit you up about uh, about doing sessions, but not outside of Texas, right? Not outside of Texas because of licensing laws. Yeah. Right. But it okay. residents of Texas, yeah, can hit me up. And you can just send an email to info at dreebony.com. Man, it really is amazing. You know, it's an amazing thing. Also, just the idea of Dr. Ebony and what you do yeah. and just what that means is is so beautiful, so perfect. Yeah. Well, thank you. Well, I am beyond grateful. I have a thousand things that I could ask you. And um, honestly, you there, have there me are back. Some, I enjoy it. The, I, please. And there are certain parts of this where I'm like, Ali, don't start trying to have a personal therapy session with Dr. <laughs> Ebony right now. Because some of the things that you were talking about, I was like, <laughs> <laughs> okay, so then what about, um, <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> you know what I mean? Because so much of it has just been like, you know what? And I'm pretty early on my journey. And um, you know, a lot of times what, what you were just reflecting in uh, in the message that you wrote about when somebody connected us on on Twitter. I'm not really on Twitter like that either. Mm. I have it. I like I have an account. I just post the things I do. That's it. A lot of times, someone will even post for me. And um, so the fact that somebody connected us there um, was was a really amazing thing. But that you just you know, and I know this from being an underground artist. You know, like I've been making music for 20 years. The, something mm-hmm. I put out in 2003, somebody may just find it now. Yeah. And it's, you know, it was never a hit record, but it's new to them and it's mm-hmm. doing something for them. I don't I don't know if this albino guy that lives in Istanbul was was <laughs> ever your, like, <laughs> you know, who you, I but no it's, been, it's been profoundly helpful. Mm-hmm. Like your work has, um, you know, just hearing the humanity and, um, you know, also because so much of my own relationship with, um, coping 
and food was like black women cared for me and fed me when I was young. So it was like, mm. I don't know how to, I, I can't stop the world from being the world. I don't have language to make you feel better, but sweet potato pie will make you feel instantly better. Yes. <laughs> it will make you feel loved. And if we don't have that, then we'll put some chips on this thing and do this thing and whatever. But, right. you know, that, that like going back to that feeling and, and trying to recreate that and not even necessarily realizing what that is. And, you know, so whether it's, the, you know, a cultural connection uh, or just the raw humanity of you doing all of these things um, out loud and for us to, to witness. And you're just incredibly, incredibly generous. And I would say whatever you feel like sharing of your story is fine. You're sharing so much of the of the process of getting well and the process of reclaiming a, a, a person's own right to be whole. Mm-hmm. That is just, it's tremendous. It's tremendous. Yeah, and you are loved and appreciated Thank and you. celebrated at our house. Thank you. All right. Take good care. Thank you so much, Dr. Okay. Abby. Thank you so much. Special thanks to Dr. Ebony for being so generous with her time and with her reflections and with her professional opinion and her insight and wisdom. It's it's really so, so, so important and so precious to be able to talk to her and to get some insight into the world of therapy. Um, Make sure to check out her work, follow her on social media, check out her website, check out all of her books. Listen to her podcast, Food Is Not Bay. Check out her live streams and all of the things that she has to offer. And check out my therapy cards. They're incredible. They're produced beautifully. They're they're so insightful. They're such amazing opportunities to really sit with ourselves and just become better acquainted with our own reality so that we can transition into living lives of fullness and of wholeness and of wellness. Uh, special thanks to our sponsor, Zakat Foundation, to BetterHelp. Again, if you go to BetterHelp, B-E-T-T-E-R-H-E-L-P.com slash travelers, you'll get a discount, and they also send some help our way to help us with the work that we do on this podcast. Special thanks to Amna Mirza, to Mansour Panawala. Special thanks to Aida Rashid, to Shane Atkinson, to all of the people that give us feedback and insight that help make this podcast what it is. Special thanks to Last Word. Special thanks to Mark from Medina, who designed our logo. Special thanks to Ant, who created the music that we use as the theme music for this podcast. Uh, Follow us online. Go to brotherali.com, sign our mailing list, join the the caravan, all of this stuff. Like and share and subscribe and comment. All of this stuff helps the work that we're doing here on the Travelers Podcast. Thank you for being with us every week. The Travelers Podcast is produced by Brendan Kelly, a.k.a. BK1, and it's a product of Travelers Media. We thank you. We love you. We appreciate you. We're praying for you. And we wish you well. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh.